So if you actually counted up all the questions Jesus asked in the, uh, recorded in the four Gospels, they would come out to more than 300. There are 300 questions Jesus asks in the four Gospels, far more than he was asked. Um, and there's probably many reasons for that. Uh, someone should write a book on that. Actually, someone has, not me. Um, but I think he asked these questions of so many people because in part what mattered toward, to receiving him was the posture of people's hearts. And so he asked lots of questions about their hearts. There's six questions he asks alone in our passage today, at least in English translation. The ancient Greek text didn't have question marks at that time. But we're now here in chapter 11 of Matthew, and he is kind of a celebrity in the regions of Galilee. Wherever he goes, a crowd gathers. And some of those people would also have been there back in Matthew chapter 3 when John the Baptist was announcing his coming and, of course, where John the Baptist baptized Jesus in the wilderness. And so now he has a question for those people about that moment. In our text, it's in verse 7. What did you go out in the wilderness to look at? He asked them. What did you go out to see out there? It's a good question. Uh, it's a good question wherever Jesus attracts attention. What are you coming out to see? Who do you think he is? What have we come out to see again today? The other night, my daughter called. Um, she lives in L.A. She goes to Vintage Church, which is in our diocese. It's, a, um, it's an Anglican church. It, it uh, doesn't quite do the liturgy, but um, she's finding a great home there at Vintage. It's a great church. Um, she's also looking to connect with other uh, people in L.A. who are walking in the way. And so she went with a friend to hear a speaker who had flown in, a Christian speaker who was speaking at a theater downtown. Uh, there was a huge crowd there. Um, and the speaker's content, she told me, was really great. Um, but as it went on, it felt increasingly like a performance, or at least that's how the crowd was treating it. Um, a kind of cross between a concert and a one-man play. Um, you know, and there were, in fact, celebrities, highly visible celebrities sitting in the front row, people taking pictures on their phones, talking to one another, some listening, some half listening. Um, and I want to be careful here. Because she and I both agreed it was so good that so many people were there to hear the truth and wisdom. Um, we with Paul say, in this we rejoice that Christ is preached. So good. But my daughter's a little kind of like me. She's like a little sociologist. Um, and as she looked around the room, she kind of wondered, like Jesus asked, what did these people come out to see, actually? John the Baptist's content was quite good in the wilderness. Um, and of course, his message was that through repentance, people needed to prepare for the coming of the Lord, the Messiah, um, the return of the King, um, prophesied to rescue the Hebrew people from their oppressors and to be installed in the temple of Jerusalem to rule. John is kind of on Jesus' mind here now in chapter 11 in Galilee, not in the wilderness, because John has just sent a few of his disciples to ask him a question. You see, John had to send disciples because John's in prison at this moment. He's in prison because he criticized uh, one of the Jewish kings, Herod, for divorcing his wife and marrying his half-brother's wife, Herodias. John was criticizing him, saying this is no fit behavior for a Jewish king. And so Herod Antipas threw him in jail. So that's not a king that the Jews wanted. And of course, nor is Caesar a king that the Jews wanted. He was the oppressor. So these two rulers, like so many, failed to rule justly. And hence the excitement in the wilderness when John announced that there's a coming king who's going to take their place. 
In fact, Jesus, when he comes, steps into a story that is hundreds of years old by now, and it's formed from two, at least two, prominent historical experiences of the people of God. One, of course, was the rescue of the people of God from Pharaoh in Egypt through the Exodus. And the other, of course, was the rescue from their exile among the Babylonians. And the story was that God was going to do this again. He was going to rescue his people now from the oppression of the Romans and install himself as king in Jerusalem once again. We hear this everywhere in the uh, Old Testament. Psalm 2 is a kind of coronation psalm, right? It celebrates this coming freedom by saying, I will make nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them, the nations, with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. In the words of Zechariah, 500 years before Jesus, um, by the return of God to the temple in Jerusalem, he writes, I will save my people from the east country, from the west country, and I will bring them to dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people. I'll be their God in faithfulness and in righteousness. See, the expectation was that the Messiah, and for John, Jesus, his cousin, um, was going to come in and establish the reign of God with sweeping political power. This is what John the Baptist had in view for the Messiah. And we know John's fiery call to repentance. We recall it from Matthew 3. Um, to prepare their hearts for this new king. You're going to be on the wrong, you're going to want to be on the right side of this, John is saying. So now here we are again back in Matthew 11. And Jesus is reflecting on that moment. He's thinking about John in prison. And John is thinking about Jesus. In fact, John is having his doubts. We're told in this passage, now when John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? John is hearing about what Jesus is going on to do. And now he's a little uncertain about Jesus, honestly. And so he sends his disciples to say, you know, are, are you really the one or is there another? You see, because Jesus wasn't acting quite like John's idea of a Messiah. So what was it about Jesus' deeds that John heard about that gave him cause for concern? Well, in chapter 4, Jesus himself is calling for repentance. Repent, for the kingdom of God has come near. So it can't be that. That's John's message. But then we're told a few verses later in chapter 4, that Jesus was going throughout Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. And in the sermon after that in Matthew, Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5, 6, and 7, he's doing a lot of teaching. But it doesn't sound like a warrior messiah. It's teaching about the warning against anger, the warning against vengeance, and, God forbid, praying for our enemies. See, rather than creating a political movement, Jesus seemed to be spending his time doing a lot of healing and mending and patience. He, was, he healed a Roman soldier's servant, the enemy. He healed Peter's mother-in-law, hopefully not the enemy. He was restoring demoniacs. He was healing a paralytic whom he also forgave his sins. He raised a girl from the dead. He healed a woman suffering from hemorrhages. He heals two blind men. And worst of all, in some ways, he was hanging out with disreputable people who may have not yet repented. His ethos was a little more like a shepherd than a king. In fact, Matthew records when he saw the crowds, Jesus had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So John sitting in prison is like, is he departing from the script? Which was supposed to be kind of heavy on judgment, heavy on overthrow, heavy on power, real politic, right? Fighting fire with fire if necessary. And you remember John's language. 
Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now that's what John came out to see. And so did many others in that wilderness that day in Matthew 3. And that's understandable. And Jesus will talk plenty about his kingdom. And he will talk plenty in the months to come about a just judgment. I mean, who wouldn't want a just judgment against injustice? And Jesus would affirm the law and the prophets, but the reputation he was developing that gave John for concern was a reputation for compassion, for healing, a shepherd-like care for the weak and good news for the poor. See, for John in prison, it's almost like he was campaigning for one Messiah, but the one he kind of baptized and launched was now kind of working from a little bit different platform. It's as if, for Jesus, the first hundred days in office is not primarily about crushing the opposition, but rolling up his sleeves and going right to work with the people, ushering in a new kingdom, not from the top down, but from the ground up. And so it's for all these reasons that John is concerned and he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one who's to come or are we to wait for another? John's not now sure. And Jesus, in our passage, in verses 4 and 5, gives these disciples from John the answer to the question. And it's almost in code. It's almost like the eagle has landed, you know, when the first men landed on the moon. Um, Because after all, there are spies in the crowd in Matthew 11 that day, listening for words like king and messiah, waiting to alert the authorities. And so Jesus puts his answer in code. Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. That's Jesus' answer to, are you the one? What kind of an answer is that? Well, it's one that John, when he hears it, would remember, as other Jews would who knew the scriptures. We see it in verses 4 to 6 of our Isaiah passage today. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf, the ear, dears, the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy, for water shall break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. That's a lovely image. We hear it in Psalm 146 in our passage today. The Lord watches over the strangers. He upholds the orphan and the widow. We hear it negatively in Ezekiel 34, when Ezekiel is judging the Israelite rulers at the time, and he says, the weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness, rather, you have ruled them. For sure, also in all these passages, there is overthrow and justice for the people in the cards against the professor, pr- oppressors. <laughs> it's finals week, and it could mean that for our students... It's the, it's the professors that should be overthrown. <laughs> but in this case, it's the oppressors. And this will be for later. When Jesus brings the fullness of his kingdom. But Jesus is sending a message now to these disciples of John about what the kingdom looks like up close. Kind of on the street. In relationships. In life. With the little people. And the kind of power this looks like is healing. Restoration. Salvation, strengthening, binding up. This is a different kind of power, perhaps, than many had come out to see. Jesus knew this was not exactly what many had in mind, although we just saw it was prophesied, these things. And that's why he says in the next verse, blessed are those who take no offense in me. See, the early Christians also seemed to kind of know that this is what the kingdom of God was about. They called it salvation, as the scriptures do. Historian Rodney Stark has written a 
really important book called The Rise of Christianity. And there he notes that the Roman Emperor Julian, now 300 years after Christ, uh, was complaining in a letter to one of the Roman high priests that Rome needed to take better care of the people in ways equal to these Christians of whom Julian was no fan, calling them the impious Galileans. But Julian writes in the letter to the high priest, I think that when the poor happen to be neglected and overlooked by the priest, that would be the Roman uh, pagan priests, the impious Galileans observed this and devoted themselves to benevolence. They not only support their poor, but they support our poor. And everyone can see that our people lack aid from us. It perhaps pained Jesus to correct his cousin John a little on this matter because he clearly had great respect for John and for his message of repentance. And he spends the rest of our passage in Matthew 11 kind of singing his praises, saying, if you came out to hear a real prophet, well, that was a good reason to come out because John's a real prophet preparing the way of the Lord. Jesus says in our passage, there might be other reasons you've come out. In verse 9, he asks, what then did you go out in that wilderness to see? Was it a reed shaken by the wind? Someone dressed in soft robes who lives in royal palaces? Apparently, celebrity and spectacle was a thing even back then. Uh, the reed blowing in the wind was perhaps a symbol of Herod himself, pomp and circumstance, because on the other side of his coin, the, the image for him was a reed. But the message here is, if you want to come out to see a Messiah and the glory of the breaking out of the kingdom, it's going to look like changed lives. It's going to look like rescue and healing. It's going to look like goodness. It's going to look like the weak and those who mourn and the pure will have an inheritance. Well, if you come out to see those things, well, then you've come out for the right thing. You know, this admonition is also to us, I think. What do we come out for? Every Sunday, every time together. Well, I suspect knowing this church, we come out to see these very things. We come out to seek the kingdom of God as it breaks out in these forms. And we trust that God, yes, in the big picture, will take care of the future. Now you might say, well, Jesus was uniquely equipped to announce the kingdom in these ways. You might say, I can't really do things like miracles and healing. I can't link the lame walk. I can't raise people from the dead. I can't bring sight to the blind. I can't heal skin diseases. Unless, of course, you're a dermatologist. Um, I can't make the lame walk. Well, it's true. We, we can't do miracles like Jesus did, which is not to say, by the way, that miracles and healing don't occur. Where they do occur, that's Jesus. But remember, these aren't the only kinds of healing. They are kind of, if you will, icons of a more comprehensive healing that we need in our lives. You remember that the lame man Jesus healed, he first forgave. As if the healing that we really seek and need are from disabilities in our hearts. This semester so far, I've received about 500 prayer requests from students. I read them all. I pray for them, if only briefly. And there are plenty this term that have addressed physical healing for sure. But then there are these, and I quote, I want to be more vulnerable with people around me and let them into my life. I so often feel unloved. Another writes, Lord, slow me down enough to experience Jesus fully and love others deeply. Another Pray for God to draw me closer to him. I feel a distance from him, and I don't like it. I want intimacy with him. Another, I need help with navigating things that I am going through, grieving the loss of friends, the loss of dreams. Another, our family has been ruined because of an addiction to alcohol, and I want my relationships with them to be fixed. A family member won't talk to me after a mistake I made. And I miss her a lot, so it's been really hard. I feel so far from God. I want my relationship with him to be restored. 
Another, I need prayer for my insecurities because it's making me hate myself and bitter to the people I love. Another, I need hope in a family loss and challenge that I'm going through. It feels really hopeless. And I don't know how God will bring something good out of this situation. Another, Lord, please show me you love me that I may know it in the fiber of my being that you define my worth despite the outside circumstances and inside fears. What do these prayer requests ask for? Restored relationships, intimacy with God, grieving as those with hope, overcoming shame and guilt, fears that we are unlovable, hope for redemption. I think when all is said and done, this is what the, these college students and probably all of us want to come out to see. <laughs> Forgiveness, hope, reconciliation, redemption, love. And the Bible calls all of these things salvation. So as we come to this church week after week, what do we come out to see? Again, I suspect it's these things. We want to see how Jesus is going to do this among us. We are listening for it in the liturgy. We're listening for it in the scriptures. We're looking for it in our relationships. As we walk both with others in this church and by extension people in our neighborhood, we are seeking this kingdom of God. Paul calls it in Philippians 2, 12 and 13, working out our salvation. This is what we come out to do. <laughs> we are working out our salvation, not in the sense, of course, of our justification. We have been forgiven, but working out now this life of healing and rescue that God wants to do in us. For us at HTC, and remember our diocese is called C4SO, Church for the Sake of Others, we also spoke focus on spiritual formation. Why is that? Because our formation will be one of the most visible ways that people can see the kingdom of God. I think after the rants, after the sound bites, after the soft robes and palaces, people eventually realize that this is what they want. Forgiveness, rescue, healing, and of course, love from God, as well as others. This is what they will come out to see. And when they do, what we get to do is bear witness to this kingdom, which is not just to tell people about it, but to bear witness to it in our very lives, how God has healed us rescued us, restored us. That Jesus is in our midst, healing, saving. This is not to put a burden on us for instant change, as if we suddenly need to be this amazing, uh, healthy, mature group of people in order to bear witness. No, I think people are looking for honest people. But people who are walking in the way, a patient abiding, a trusting journey, a long salvation in the same direction. People who are patient with God and patient with others as a result. In our epistle passage today, the author uh, James writes, Be patient, therefore, beloved, until the coming of the Lord. Be patient. The farmer, for instance, waits for the precious crop from the earth being patient with it until it receives the early and the late rains. James is certainly referring to the time when Jesus will bring the fullness of the kingdom. And you and I know that that's the only way this whole world is going to be saved. But it also goes in the meantime for the restoration happening among us. Be patient with your restoration. Be patient with the coming of the Lord in your life. Let the Lord put you back together like those kintsugi ceramic bowls in which the cracks are still evident, but there's a lining of grace as we are patient for that healing to harden, for that vessel to be mended. And this takes time takes time because the ways that we have been wounded and wounded ourselves, well, those are the same ways we need to be healed, and that takes time. But we can be patient, right, if the Lord is near. 
and if we have others walking with us. Patience, interestingly, is first on the list of Paul's description of love in 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. And then it's kind, as if patience leads to kindness. I'm going to leave you with a poem by Teilhard de Chardin, theologian and philosopher, and I've adapted it slightly, so if you go look it up, it might be a little different. But I hope this encourages you to walk in hopeful trust with God, to in the meantime, let the kingdom of God emerge among us, that we might be a place where people can come out to see it as we work out our salvation. Chardin's poem is called Patient Trust. Above all, trust in the slow work of God. We are quite naturally impatient in everything to reach the end without delay. We want to skip the intermediate stages. We are impatient of being on the way to something, something unknown, something new. In it, it is the law of all progress that these things take time. And so I think it is with you. You grow gradually. Let your life grow. Let God shape it. Don't try to force it. As though you could be today what time, that is to say grace and circumstances, acting on your own goodwill, as though you could be today what time will make of you tomorrow. Only God could say what this new spirit gradually forming within you will look like. But give our Lord the benefit of believing that his hand is leading you and be patient, though feeling yourself always on the way and incomplete. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.